Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. As part of our continuing education for healthcare professionals, the AIUM is pleased to host this webinar on new guidelines for liver stiffness quantification with Dr. Richard Barr. This program is a non-CME educational activity in collaboration with Samsung. Today's webinar will discuss chronic liver disease, physics and basic science as they pertain to shear wave elastography, and the proper technique, sonographic application, and interpretation of liver elastography. If you have questions for the presenter during this webinar, you may type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering questions until he has completed his presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'd like to present Dr. Richard Barr. Thanks, Darcy. Um, thank you for um, joining us today. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about liver stiffness and the new uh, SRU guidelines. And I want to thank Samsung for sponsoring this uh, lecture series. Um, chronic liver disease is a substantial worldwide problem. Its major consequence is increasing deposition of fibrous tissue within the liver, leading to the development of cirrhosis and its consequences of portal hypertension, hepatic insufficiency, and hepatocellular carcinoma. The stage of liver fibrosis is important to determine prognosis, surveillance, prioritization for treatment, and now that we have potential for reversibility to follow those uh, treatment uh, modifications. The process of fibrosis is dynamic and regression of fibrosis is possible with treatment of the underlying conditions. Previously, the only method of staging the degree of fibrosis was liver biopsy. And liver biopsy is really an imperfect histological reference standard. And although it can um, be a reference for fibrosis assessment, staging and classification of steatosis, necrosis, and inflammatory activity, it is invasive with severe complications and up to 1%. It represents 1 50,000th of the liver volume. And most importantly, there's considerable intra-observer variability between pathologists with kappa or agreement values ranging from 40 to 90% in studies. From a clinical standpoint, cirrhosis consists of at least two distinct clinical stages. We have chronic liver disease that goes to compensated cirrhosis, to decompensated cirrhosis, and then to death. And decompensated cirrhosis is a very easy clinical diagnosis, as these are the patients that present with variceal hemorrhage, ascites, encephalopathy, and jaundice. Compensated cirrhosis, on the other hand, is not an easy diagnosis, as they don't have those complicating features. And Compensated cirrhosis can be divided into two different categories, those without varices versus those with varices. And as you'll notice that the key here is decompensated cirrhosis mean survival is approximately two years, where compensated cirrhosis, the mean survival is greater than 12 years with uh, the possibility of having varices uh, increasing by a factor of three, the one year mortality. So the goal of the hepatologist is to identify these patients before they get to decompensated cirrhosis and possibly even before they get to compensated cirrhosis, as obviously when they get to decompensated cirrhosis, uh, they have a very poor prognosis. When we look at elastography for liver fibrosis, um, there are several methods that have been uh, proposed. Strain elastography, which has very limited literature and we will not discuss today. 1D shear wave elastography or transient elastography, point shear wave, uh, or point quantification shear wave elastography using ARFI techniques, and 2D shear wave, 2D shear wave elastography using ARFI techniques, and MRE, magnetic resonance elastography, which we'll just briefly mention today. So the, the most of our talk today is going to be on the two ARFI techniques, point shear wave and 2D shear wave. It's really important that you remember that elastography measures stiffness. It does not measure fibrosis only. And stiffness is influenced not only by fibrosis, 
but increased hepatic pressures from portal hypertension, hepatic congestion, or increased blood flow from the digestion of food and inflammation. So again, it's very important that you realize this and that you look for these other factors which can complicate interpretation of the degree of liver fibrosis. Point shear wave uses an RFI pulse to generate shear waves in a small, approximately one cc ROI. We have real-time imaging, so masses and large vessels can be identified and avoided, and we can systematically select different parts of the liver to sample. In 2D shear wave elastography, we take multiple measurements using RFI over a larger field of view. And this can be done as a single image or performed in real time. And real time imaging is uh, possible. So in B mode imaging, we can look for masses and large vessels and we can avoid these. We have a color coding on all the different vendors. So we color code the large field of view. So you get an overview by looking at the color and it also helps in assessing where to put your ROI to do your measurements. This allows for averaging over a larger area and most vendors have a quality or confidence map that will help avoid artifacts in placing the ROI. This slide is very busy, but it's all the things that we discuss in the SRU consensus that was published in radiology in 2015. So we have all these different disease states, all of which lead to fibrosis and onto cirrhosis if not treated. We have pretest and post-test probability. We have age, gender, ethnicity, and lab tests that may affect our results. We have patient factors such as obesity, ascites, medications, and fasting that affect our results. Comorbidities, acute on chronic disease, as well as vascular congestion can affect our results. And we also have various methods of performing elastography, both by MR and ultrasound, and very different types of ultrasound, and different types of hardware and software within the ultrasound vendors and the experience and variability of the person performing and interpreting the examination. So we have to keep all these in mind when we interpret uh, liver elastography and we'll briefly go over all of these uh, today and point out uh, pitfalls. I think it's important that you do read uh, the SRU guidelines. An update has just been published in radiology, um, which uh, has updated things and we'll go over that in detail as we go through the talk. So in performing the examination, we want to use an intercostal approach to the right lobe of the liver. Patients should raise their hand above their head to increase the intercostal space. And that's not to put the hand on their head, that's to actually stretch out and increase those ribs. You can even have them do a little bit of a bend. Some people call it like a banana. Uh, that opens up the rib space and that optimizes our B-mode imaging. And we want to look for the best acoustical window uh, because shadowing and artifacts from the B-mode imaging are going to interfere with accurate measurements. It's important that you realize that the RFI pulse uh, generates the shear waves, but it's actually our B-mode imaging that tracks the shear waves. Therefore, a bad B-mode image actually implies that you're going to get a bad elastography measurement. Measurements should be taken during breath hold in a neutral breathing position. As we take a deep breath in and hold it or do a Valsalva, we increase our right heart pressure. That pressure is transmitted through the inferior vena cava to the hepatic veins and the liver becomes stiffer. And the reverse is true when we exhale. So it's very important that everyone in your lab uses the same technique and uses the same position of breathing. Uh, we find that when we have a real time B mode image that's going along with this is very easy to watch the liver and make sure that number one, the patient is not moving and number two, that we're doing the measurements in a neutral breathing position. Measurements should be taken in the right lobe of the liver. Le measurements in the left lobe of the liver are usually unreliable because of motion from the cardiac pulsations. We want to avoid the first one and a half to two centimeters in the liver capsule. Um, this is more critical in point shear wave than it is in 2D shear wave, because in point shear wave, we don't have that color map that it flags to us where the artifacts are. In 2D shear wave, this is less critical because you'll see the artifact on that large color map. And in large patients, it's sometimes helpful to move the, uh, R the field of view box up closer to the liver capsule. Uh, you may be able to get better measurements there. As most RFE systems have the maximum push at four to four and a half centimeters 
from the transducer. So that's the optimal place. That's where we're going to get the best shear waves. As we go deeper to that measurement, then we're going to get attenuation of the RFE pulse, therefore weaker shear waves, therefore more air in the measurement. We want to avoid large vessels and bile ducts. And the RFE pulse should be kept perpendicular to the liver capsule, because if it isn't, a lot of the energy from the RFE pulse will be refracted off of the liver capsule and limit our uh, ability to generate good shear waves. This is an example of the reverberation artifact. Uh, let me see if I can grab a little arrow. And again, here you can see this red and, and the uh, kind of teal area here are all reverberation artifacts. The true stiffness of the liver is here in the blue areas. But again, you can see that if we put this up close to the liver capsule in 2D, it's very easy to see where the artifact is. Obviously in point shear wave where we don't have the coloring, then it's uh, not possible to know exactly where the artifacts are and can lead to errors. When we look at factors that affect the RFE measurement, um, the tissue displacement, the shear wave height is dependent on the strength of the RFE pulse. And we know that the RFE pulse is attenuated as it traverses tissue. Therefore, measurements taken at greater depth have less signal to noise. And in general, in most systems, eight centimeters is the limit. But on most systems, after we get about six centimeters from the transducer, we start to lose enough energy in the RFE pulse that we start to get inaccurate measurements. And this attenuation is greater with a stiffer liver. So patients with advanced cirrhosis measurements can be more variable. This is also true in patients that have a very steatotic liver. Um, and can the RFE pulse be refracted from the liver capsule? I think it's true, and we are going to uh, probably be publishing a paper shortly that shows that when you angle the transducer, either superior or inferior, right to left from the liver capsule, the shear wave heights markedly decrease and you get uh, wrong measurements. So it's very important that the RFE pulse is perpendicular, both superior and inferior, and right to left in the liver capsule. I mentioned breathing before, and again, it's very critical that measurements are taken during patient or scanner motion uh, are, uh, are inaccurate. So when we look at this, the shear waves only travel over two, three, maybe four millimeters. So motion is very, very critical. So we do need to have the patient hold still. If they're moving, uh, we're going to get inaccurate measurements or no measurement at all. So breathing uh, control is uh, critical when we do these measurements. And again, it should be in a neutral position, not inspiration or expiration. And in general, we know that when we ask people to hold their breath, the first thing they do is take a deep breath in and hold it. And we don't want that to happen. So we usually practice with the patient before starting taking measurements and ask them again to stop breathing and say, please don't take a breath in or breath out. When I say, hold your breath, just stop breathing. And again, and those systems that have a real time 2D going on, most of the 2D shear waves do, you can actually watch the liver motion to see if they are taking a breath in or out. With point shear waves, most systems do not have real-time B-mode imaging, and therefore you really don't know what the patient has done. This is an example to show you the effect of breathing. So this is actually myself. These were taken less than a minute apart. As you can see, I have a nice steatotic liver. And um, when I do neutral breathing, I have a normal shear wave speed of 0.5 meters per second. And when I did the best valve I could do, I actually could make myself cirrhotic. So breathing can make a huge change in the degree of stiffness values in these measurements. So it's very critical that you control this. Everyone in your lab should be using the same method to uh, obtain the same values to make them more reproducible. When we look at variables that will affect the uh, shear wave elastography, we have acute on chronic conditions. So anything that's inflammatory, elevated liver or enzymes greater than five times the upper limits are normal, you'll not be able to estimate the degree of liver fibrosis because of the acute inflammation. Alcoholic cirrhosis of patients have uh, have a continued drinking uh, when you do the exam. There's a huge amount of inflammation. And to really be able to assess the degree of fibrosis in alcoholic um, liver disease, we almost have to have the patient abstain from drinking for about a month. Multiple disease etiology. So again, anything that will increase the right heart pressure, 
congestive heart failure, renal uh, failure with or fluid overload will also allow uh, the measurements to be higher. So if you use a cutoff table, you're going to overestimate the degree of liver fibrosis. When we eat, we have increased blood flow to the gut, increased blood flow to the portal vein, and the liver becomes stiffer because of that increased blood flow. So we recommend that you have the patients fast for at least four hours before the examination. And we tend to do these in the morning as we would do gallbladder examinations. Obviously, eating will only make the measurements higher. So if you do do the measurements and someone has eaten and they're in a normal range, they're normal and you don't need to repeat the examination. Um, we, if the patient did eat and we know, we mentioned that in the report if their measurements are elevated and we allow the referring physician to decide if he wants to send the patient back for a repeat examination uh, during a fasting. You don't want to sample on or near vessels or bile ducts. I would say at least stay five millimeters away from each of these. Remember, this is a 3D process, so in and out of plane vessels are going to cause this problem. Again, difference between point shear wave and 2D shear wave. In point shear wave, you don't know where these uh, artifacts are. You can see the blood vessels and you could try to stay away from them. On 2D shear wave, these actually show up as artifacts. And we'll talk about a confidence map that uh, flags these so uh, you can avoid these when you do your measurement. Again, we want to stay away from Glisson's capsule. Um, what we have noticed is you can, the reverberation artifact can be anywhere from a few millimeters to up to two centimeters. So if you're doing point shear wave, you really must stay one and a half to two centimeters below the liver capsule. But as I showed you before, if you're doing 2D shear wave, it's okay to move the field a few bucks up. You can see the artifact and avoid it. You don't want to sample at the edge of a sector and you don't want to sample near rib shadows because the ultrasound beams are being bent, and this is not black shadowing, any shadowing. I like to say we really need to have the liver to have a homogeneous signal intensity. Otherwise, there are, there are areas of shadowing going on. We don't want to sample in the left lobe of the liver. As we know, we get inaccurate measurements. Any motion patient or the person doing the scanning um, can cause problems. And sometimes this is a problem because the patients may have a very pulsatile aorta, which is causing motion. And if you can find a window that that's minimized, that will help to get more accurate and reproducible results. And again, anything that increases the right heart pressure is going to increase the stiffness of the liver. So in pediatric patients with Fontan or other cardiac surgeries, this is a problem um, and will limit the ability to uh, accurately identify the amount of fibrosis. Other confounding factors that are patient dependent, again, congestive heart failure, renal failure with fluid overload, exacerbation of acute hepatitis with associated transaminase levels. As a general rule, if the liver enzymes are five times the upper limits of normal, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to estimate the degree of fibrosis. And as we mentioned, ingestion of food will also increase the value over up two to four hour period. So we like, again, have the patient fast for four hours. Factors that can elevate liver stiffness also include extra hepatic cholecystasis, the use of beta blockers, which can change the portal pressures, and doing a Valsalva, as I showed you in myself. Steatosis probably does not affect the liver stiffness values. However, it does make it more difficult to get an accurate measurement because of the attenuation of the RV pulse. Um, in the future, we may be doing something called dispersion, where we're looking at the shear wave speed at various ARFI frequencies. That probably will be affected by steatosis, but um, as of yet, that's not um, well understood, and there are very few systems at this point that are doing diffusion imaging. Uh, we need more information on that to see how that's going to uh, fall out. When we talk about different systems, it's important that you realize things that can make uh, things variable between systems. So I think the most important is the shear wave frequency content. So the RFI pulse is an old fashioned pulse with a, um, a focal zone, which is again, usually centered at four to four and a half centimeters from the transducer. Um, and it has a mean frequency and it also has a bandwidth. When we look at things like transient elastography, it does not have a bandwidth. It has a fixed frequency 
uh, which um, eliminates this problem. So every vendor has a different frequency, mean frequency, which is gonna cause some variability. And also this is a problem when we go to different depths in a very diastotic liver because the higher frequencies are attenuated. So the mean RV frequency will change as we go deeper in the liver in those patients that are cirrhotic or uh, very steatotic. So we expect to get different measurements uh, in these patients. So it's very important that in your lab, you have a protocol that you're taking measurements at the same depth. And if a patient comes back, always try to repeat the same location and depth that'll eliminate that bias. Each vendor has their own reconstruction algorithms. They assume propagation in one direction or two directions. Um, they make some uh, other assumptions um, that um, some vendors do better than others. Um, so this is also something that can cause a variability between systems. Uh, and again, um, the exact way they do this and how good they are at eliminating algorithm, uh, algorithms that uh, remove artifacts also are very important. But I think it's really important that although we know these are occurring, in reality, uh, this is a study from Dr. Ferrioli from Pavia, Italy, where they looked at 20, I think it was 26 patients and all the different vendors. Um, and we had multiple people do the examinations. And what you can see is when we looked at all the data, there was a little more variability but when we looked at those that are really clinically important, those that are below the level of cirrhosis, the variability actually was not that great. So in general, in the range that we're really concerned about, the variability between systems is probably on the order of 10% or less, which is actually within the area of measurement. So um, we really are no longer are so worried about the, which measurements you have. Again, this is our protocol. I like to say we have to have three parallel lines, the transducer, the liver capsule, and the top of the field of view box or ROI box. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, we'd like to stay one and a half to two centimeters when we're doing point shear wave. 2D shear wave, it's not as critical as long as you realize the artifact and avoid it. You know, we can report measurements in either meters per second or kilopascals, and it's important that you realize all systems, including transient elastography, will measure the shear wave speed in meters per second, and then they can convert those to Young's modulus or kilopascals. MRE, on the other hand, is different using um, shear's modulus. And again, we make some assumptions, and everyone makes the same assumptions to convert meters per second to kilopascals. I like to say it's almost like converting inches to centimeters. So they both are exactly the same and it's very easy to do this. Many vendors will give you both. Um, many insurance companies require the results in kilopascals. So again, be just aware of that for, uh, to be eligible for antiviral treatments, although that's less of an issue now as we'll discuss as we go through the talk. And again, it's really important that all the ultrasound measurements use Young's modulus in kilopascals while the MRE provides measurements of the shear modulus in kilopascals. And the MR values are one third of what we see in ultrasound. So you have to multiply the MRE measurements by three in kilopascals to get the kilopascals we have in Young's modulus. There's really no way to convert the MRE data into meters per second because that's really uh, not what they're doing. So there was a committee called KIBA, Quantitative Image Biomarker Association. And what uh, we did is we developed phantoms that had different stiffness values and mimicked the liver. And we, again, did uh, all the different vendors in the first round. Uh, we generated what's called bias tables. So we had phantoms that were 1.1, 2.3, and 2.9 centimeters. And we did measurements at three centimeters, four and a half centimeters, and six centimeters. And these numbers here tell us how well this system did. So in this system, in a very stiff liver, 2.9 meters per second at 4.5 centimeters, it was correct. However, if we did it at a normal 1.1 meters per second at 4.5, it underestimated by 15%. And you'll notice the variability, and these variables, again, are based on differences in depth 
And again, as we've talked about, this is what we expect. So um, when we did this uh, first round several years ago, uh, we gave these data to the vendors. The vendors were able to look at their data, look at how they can correct things to make it better. And in the second round, after they made their corrections, again, we see the variability is more on the order of 10% at most between vendors. Um, so we are getting harmonization, if you will, uh, of all the vendors to get the same measurement. Um, however, we are gonna recommend that you continue to use the same system when a patient comes back um, just to increase the, uh, the um, accuracy of the measurements. So how many measurements should we take? So for point shear wave, the literature suggests 10. You shouldn't look at the numbers and say, I don't like that one. Obviously, if you had a bad number, your patient moved uh, and you recognize that there was a problem, don't put that into the report page. Um, we are going to use the median, not the mean. So we're not averaging the numbers, we're taking the middle value and that automatically gets rid of the highest and lowest values. So uh, the system is actually doing that. And if we look at the literature, those experts uh, that have been doing this can say that if you do six measurements, you probably can be okay if you're doing a very good job. There are two quality criteria that we're always going to use no matter which vendor or which ultrasound system you're going to use. Greater than 60% of the measurements are good measurements. And what do I mean by a good measurement? So that means you actually got a number. So in some systems you may get XXX or 000. In 2D will not get coloring. Um, these are telling you that the system could not calculate a shear wave speed. Doesn't mean that they're accurate. It just means that they were so bad, we couldn't get a measurement. So. Again, if you did 10 measurements and five of them were bad, then you really don't want to take 30 measurements to get 10 good measurements, because this is telling you that this is a patient that you just can't get good measurements and it's just to uh, give up and say, this patient is not a good candidate for an accurate shear wave speed. The second quality criteria that we're going to use, again, for all vendors and uh, point or 2D shear wave is the interquartile range over the median. Uh, interquartile range is where the middle 50% of the measurements live. And in kilopascals, we want that to be less than 30% or 0.3, and for meters per second, 0.15. And again, this suggests you have a good data set. That's meaning you're getting a very similar number on all your measurements. So, so that is a, a recommendation uh, or a, a, a an, an, a recommendation that these measurements are probably good. And you can use that to monitor your sonographer quality. Obviously one measurement is not to do, but over time, if you look at your sonographers, you can evaluate um, how well they're doing. And again, we use this and I look at the lab, uh, or we've been doing these now for several years. And I can tell that as we gain experience and the machines are getting better, our IQR over median continues to decrease. In the 2D shear wave, um, here again, because we can see the artifacts and we're going to avoid them, you only need to take five measurements. But again, we're going to use those two same quality criteria. 60% of the measurements are good measurements. IQR over median, less than 3.3 in kilopascals or less than, one, uh, less than 0.15 meters per second uh, as telling you you've got a good data set. Many of the vendors with the 2D system, as including the Samsung as, as shown here, have something called a quality map or a confidence map. Um, and this can be assessed the quality of the measurement. So when the system looks at each pixel, it says, are the shear waves high enough? When we look at the displacement curves, do they fall into a straight line that we can calculate uh, a shear wave speed? Um, are there any other problems? Do we have a noise in the signal? And um, it gives a rating to each of these. And then we have a scale that goes from zero, no reliability, to 1.0, highest reliability. And in general, a score of greater than 0.6 is considered to be a reliable measurement. And here you can see this color scale. So whenever you get uh, red or orange uh, or a little bit of green, 
uh, as you can see here where this vessel is, you can see these are all artifacts. We don't see a vessel here. It may be because the vessel is in front of or behind the image we're taking. So again, what we want to do is take our measurement in the, in a sense, the widest area. Uh, that's where we're going to place our ROI, telling us that we've got a good measurement with very little uh, errors. Again, all of which you're going to do is you'll get a um, report page that will give you the the me, uh, the uh, measurements. Usually, all vendors will give you kilopascals and meters per second, as here we see in the Samsung machine. It may give you the depth. It may give you some other information. Um, and again, it will give you the IQR over median. Again, um, this is for uh, kilopascal, so it's less than 30%. And then our median value, which is 10.5 kilopascals. Again, we talked about uh, down here is the reliable index, which is called reliable measurement index, RMI, on the Samsung machine. And um, again, uh, all the things we talked about um, in terms of the IQR over median and the greater than 60% measurements are very important for all vendors. When we move on to interpretation, this is from the SRU guidelines that were published in radiology in 2015. We looked at a large meta-analysis uh, of shear wave data. And what we did was, instead of trying to come off with cutoff values, we wanted to know what were the likelihood ratios. So for each shear wave speed, we calculated what was the probability of each of the metavar scores. And what you can see here is that we do really well with normals. And we do really well with um, F3s and F4s, but in the middle, there's a huge overlap, normal variability uh, between humans, and it's very, very hard. And if you'll notice, there's not one value that's above 50%. So um, again, we like this idea of likelihood ratios, and it's really not um, very good to use metavar scores because of this. And I think most guidelines, including the new SRU guidelines, advise not to use metavar cutoff values when you're looking at these, but to look at likelihood ratios. So initially the SRU in 2015 said, let's do two cutoff values, a low value below which most people are going to be F0 and F1, a high cutoff value above which most people are going to be F3 and F4, and then values in the middle that have more than normal, but not yet, um, uh, in the evidence, uh, uh, in the values of uh, compensated advanced chronic liver disease. And we published this um, table uh, with different vendors. At that time, we also gave a metavar cutoff values, which we no longer recommend uh, you use. Um, but if we want, if you want those, sometimes your hepatologist may want them. These are the values that we have for Samsung. So we have a cutoff value of 5.9 kilopascals for equal to or greater than F2. 7.6 for equal to or greater than F3, and 9.6 for equal to or greater than F4. And here you can see the area under the curve, the sensitivity as well as the specificity of these values. In 2018, um, the World Federation of Ultrasound and Medicine came up with a different set of guidelines, which were very similar to those of the SRU, but a little bit different. So they were the rule of five. Five kilopascals or less is normal. Five to 10 kilopascals in the absence of other known clinical diseases can rule out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Between 10 and 15, you need to rule out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Above 15 kilopascals, you rule in compensated advanced chronic liver disease and uh, below 20 kilopascals, you can rule out varices needing treatment. And again, the new term, instead of metavar, we're using compensated advanced chronic liver disease, which is really F3 and F4. These are the patients that are at risk for all the complications of advanced fibrosis. So what's new? We now have really excellent treatments for hepatitis C and hepatitis B that are less expensive. So in the past, we were kind of doing measurements to determine if they had uh, fibrosis high enough that uh, insurance companies would pay for treatment. I think now most places, the insurance companies are paying for treatment regardless of the degree of fibrosis. Um, so we're not doing this as a 
inclusion into getting to drugs anymore, more for follow-up. Um, and because the overlap of liver stiffness values between Metavar scores is as large, if not larger, than the difference between vendors, separate cutoff values for each vendor are now not recommended. And what's the most important thing is diagnosing compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Again, F3 and F4, in a sense, people that are at risk for all the complications. So the new SRU guidelines, we came up with the rule of four, starting at five, less than five kilopascals, which is 1.3 meters per second, high probability of being normal, less than nine kilopascals or 1.7 meters per second. In the absence of other known clinical signs, rules out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. If there are known clinical signs, may need further testing for confirmation. Between nine and 13 kilopascals, are 1.7 to 2.1 meters per second, suggestive of compensated advanced chronic liver disease, but another test should be used to confirmation as there are going to be some patients that have lower levels of fibrosis within this group. Above 13 kilopascals rules in compensated advanced chronic liver disease and greater than 17 kilopascals or 2.4 meters per second is suggestive of clinically significant portal hypertension. Again, we feel that this works very well for the viral etiologies and uh, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In the other uh, etiologies, we don't have much literature, but feel that they probably uh, will fall into this category with the exception maybe of alcoholic liver disease due to the large degree of inflammation. So the SRU also recommended to follow up patients. The consensus suggests that using the delta change of liver stiffness over time instead of absolute values, using as a baseline value in the case of viral hepatitis that obtained after viral eradication or suppression. So for hepatitis C, if the we recommend a value before treatment, and that value is just to determine if they have compensated advanced chronic liver disease. If they have stiffness values um, of nine or higher, those patients could be at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma or the other complicating features, even if the treatment works perfectly. So that initial exam is to determine if they're going to need continued follow-up for the rest of their life to evaluate for HCC or other complicating features. Um, and then we recommend treatment and after treatment and they go to baseline, we develop their own baseline and they become their own control to follow them. For pediatric patients with liver disease associated with cystic fibrosis, autoimmune hepatitis, biliary atresia and Cassatt procedure, or congenital heart disease with Fontan surgery, it is expert opinion that each subject becomes his or own control using the stiffness delta change over time to evaluate the efficacy of the treatment or the progression of disease. The variability between consecutive liver measurements assessed by the means of the interquartile range over median is the most important quality criteria. And again, when this ratio is greater than 30% in kilopascals or 15% in meters per second, the accuracy of the technique is reduced. So the best practices report the median stiffness value. And again, the system is going to give you as here in the Samsung, it'll give you that number or do all the calculations for you. Um, report the IQR over median. Again, the system will give you that number. And uh, to allow for improved reproducibility of serial measurements, the patient position equipment used both machine manufacturer and transducer frequency should be reported so that similar equipment and techniques are used in subsequent studies and discuss how the results are being reported with referring doctors as recommended. And I think we still have some physicians who are um, like the Metavar score as opposed to the system. Um, so we do give both uh, measurements. Uh, and if they want, we use the cutoff tables that are available in the literature for that system. Uh, here's a sample report. Delivered stiffness measurements were obtained on a list vendor and machine using a list the probe following the SRU guidelines, the number of measurements were obtained using either a point or 2D shear wave. The IQR was X, suggesting a good or bad data set. The liver stiffness value was X, and then the wording using in the, uh, uh, the rule of four. And consider adding the following sentences if appropriate. In the setting of elevated liver function tests, non-fancing, 
fasting, vascular congestion, the stage of liver fibrosis may be overestimated. In some patients with NAFLD, the cutoff value may be lower, seven to nine kilopascals. In etiologies other than viral hepatitis and NAFLD, the cutoff values are not well established. So again, um, what we're looking at now is we want to diagnose compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Um, if on their initial exam, they do have compensated advanced chronic liver disease, they need to be followed up every six months for HCC, even if they're treated in hepatitis C and they uh, have liver stiffness values that go back to normal. They still are at risk for HCC, not as much as uh, those that are not treated, but there's still a risk. The hepatologist wants to know if they're decompensated. So using your B mode image, look for ascites, if they've got bleeding varices or a cannulated umbilical vein. If they have compensated uh, cirrhosis, again, look at the spleen and portal vein. If they're normal, we can suggest that they have normal portal pressures. We didn't talk about spleen stiffness. It's not recommended yet, but that looks like in, in the future may be a promising a way of evaluating portal pressures. If they've got a dilated portal vein, abnormal portal vein Dopplers and large spleen and or varices, or again, as in the SRU guidelines, liver stiffness value greater than 17 kilopascals, we can suggest that they have clinically significant portal hypertension. So this is the old SRU guidelines. Again, we gave a low cutoff value below which majority of patients are F0 or F1. Notice there are still some patients that may have cirrhosis that fall into this value. So again, um, if the B mode imaging and other factors suggest the patient has cirrhosis, but their liver stiffness value is low, they probably have cirrhosis. And again, a high cutoff value above which it's almost impossible for you to have a normal value, but there may be a few patients that may be F1 in here, but the vast majority are going to be F3 and F4. So our new guidelines, what we've done, because we want to include more F3s, we've moved the higher limit, uh, which was at 15 kilopascals or 13 kilopascals. So we encompass more F3s in advanced chronic liver disease. We left the, the lower limit at five, and then we split that middle ground in half. And between um, five and nine, we're saying that in the absence of other known clinical signs, rules out compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Uh, between nine and 13, there is some probability that the patient does have these and doing another test or using clinical factors to determine if they've got compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Everyone above 13 kilopascals for the most part has compensated advanced chronic liver disease and those above 17 kilopascals uh, are suggestive of compensated, excuse me, clinically significant portal hypertension. So NAVLD is kind of our big problem now. And the literature is suggesting that some people actually with values down to seven kilopascals may have NASH. So I like to say above nine kilopascals, we're very suggestive. The patient has NASH and between seven and nine, we say NASH should be considered um, based on the present literature. And again, that may change as we get more and more uh, literature. Um, so to conclude, detection of significant fibrosis and cirrhosis is important for diagnosing, determination of treatment, prognosis, and follow-up of chronic liver disease. The literature supports the non-invasive use of various elastography techniques to assess liver stiffness. To obtain accurate liver stiffness measurements, adherence to a strict protocol is required. And again, really strict protocol. And both patient factors and scanning factors can affect results. Um, we know that we have a uh, new CPT code that uh, came out in January of 2019, 76981, ultrasound elastography parenchyma, uh, meaning an organ. Uh, you can uh, bill for this for liver, uh, or you can bill for it for um, spleen in the future. Um, this is meant for an organ. There is another code, it's a two for a focal liver lesion. So in those, when you're evaluating a lesion such as a breast mass or a thyroid mass, you have to use the other code. You're allowed to bill for an, a limited ultrasound abdomen or a complete ultrasound abdomen um, if you can do these and completely at the same setting. Um, so with that, we're gonna look to see if there are any questions. We do have one. Um, would different vendors give different results for the same patient? 
yes, we expect that there to be about a 10% variability between systems. Um, and actually that's the variability if you repeated it on the same system. Um, in a way I like to look at it, if you use the new guidelines, then each system vendor is gonna have their own sensitivity and specificity. Um, but we think this uh, the rule of four simplifies everything and, and for the most part will be pretty accurate. Um, and like I said, uh, Dr. Um, Virioli did that nice study comparing patients with experts doing the scanning uh, and the variability between systems on the same patient was um, actually not that great when we talk about where we're really important. So less than 13 kilopascals. Above 13 kilopascals, where we know the patient has compensated advanced chronic liver disease, um, because the strength of the RV pulse may vary with vendors, we have much more variability, but we do know that they have compensated advanced chronic liver disease. So from a clinical standpoint, it really doesn't matter. If there are no other questions, um, we can hold on for a little bit to see if there are some. I do want to thank uh, Samsung for uh, allowing us to uh, present this talk. Um, as um, I think that uh, Darcy is going to tell you, this will be available uh, free on the um, AIUM website for the next three years. So uh, if you want to look at this again, uh, please uh, go ahead and do that. And I got another question. Can you do the exam on a separate day after the ultrasound? You can, but now you don't have to. In the past, before we had this new CPT code, the previous code that was really meant for transient elastography, uh, you could not do um, the imaging on the same day as you did the elastography. But with these new codes, you're allowed to do um, both. As long as you complete a limited or a complete uh, ultrasound examination, you're allowed to bill for it at the same time you bill. And we've been doing this now since that new code came out and we are getting reimbursed for the vast majority of patients. I think we have some problems with um, Medicaid patients or some of the um, Medicare uh, PPO uh, uh, providers uh, are less likely to uh, do that. Um, and then there's another question. Why, since the technology is the same, why do different vendors have different measurement results? Well, they're not the same. The RFE pulse varies between each vendor. It has its own mean frequency and bandwidth, and that uh, causes the problem. Each vendor has their own algorithm um, of how they do things. So um, again, I think we're getting some harmonization so that the machines are getting closer. But at this point, the latest R, uh, Kiba data suggests and the, the study by Dr. Ferrioli confirmed that there's probably about a, up to a 10% variability between systems, which is actually the variability if you repeated the measurement on the same machine. Um, another question is how is it on uh, lesions of the liver? So as a general rule, we know that uh, malignant lesions tend to be stiffer uh, and benign lesions appear to be softer and that's true for liver, but we have stiff hemangiomas and we have soft HCC. So in, in terms of focal liver lesions, it doesn't work that well in a given patient um, because you can be fooled. And I think Dr. Wilson uh, from Canada did a nice study. I think the first author on that papers was Yang, Y-A-N-G. Uh, and she showed that again, yes, malignant lesions tend to be stiffer, uh, but um, in, an, in a given patient, you just can't believe that. Uh, another question is by known clinical signs, do you mean jaundice, ascites, uh, and by may need further test, do you mean CBC, spleen size? So um, we don't mean jaundice and ascites because uh, those could be it, but we there's other blood tests, the fibrous test. Uh, there's several blood tests that can be used to assess fibrosis. Um, the clinical signs, if again, um, there, there are many different clinical signs that we can use. Um, I think most people would be using the blood tests to see, uh, or if um, like platelet count um, and the CBC would also be helpful. Spleen size is another one. So again, what we do is we kind of leave this up to the hepatologist um, if their feeling is that the patient probably 
has compensated advanced chronic liver disease, they should do something else to test it um, and confirm that it, it, it is or is not uh, to be sure. Uh, how does it work for non cirrhotic PTH? So again, we don't have a lot of information on these uh, different things. Um, in these cases of um, what we like to do is do a, a, a baseline value and then just follow the patient. If the numbers are going up, they're getting worse. If they're getting going down, they're getting better. So we like that delta change uh, is a very good way of looking at these uh, other uh, etiologies. Uh, to estimate the fibrosis, the measurement should be in the same place or the entire liver should be sampled. So um, we, if we know that if you take measurements at different depths, you are going to get different values because the mean R-free frequency is testing. So you should always take the measurement in the same location. The 10 measurements should be in the same location. And when the patient comes back, you should try to repeat that in the same location. So we tend to take our measurements at two centimeters below the liver capsule in most patients. If the patient has a lot of subcutaneous fat, we may move it closer uh, in our 2D systems and avoid the reverberation artifact. But again, when they come back, uh, they should be doing. In terms of the ROI size, it doesn't have to be the same, but the ROI must not include any artifacts. So again, in the point shear waves, the ROI is fixed. You can't change it. In the 2D systems, you can, but make sure that you don't include any artifacts. So if you have a lot of artifacts, shrink the ROI so you're not including them. Um, if you don't have any artifacts and you want to average over more liver, it's, it's fine to increase the size of the ROI. As a general rule, the uh, vendor specified defaults usually work very well. Does Medicare have a reimbursement rate um, for, uh, Medicare does have any reimbursement rate for 91200, that's transient elastography. You cannot use that code now when you're doing RFE techniques. Um, I don't know the reimbursement is different um, for 76981 versus 91200, I believe it is. Um, if we have a CPT code, is the pay their payment or still considered experimental? So, um, like I said, it just depends on the insurance company. And I did our practice um, six months ago, and we were getting paid um, relatively uh, good for 85% of the cases. Most of the cases that we didn't get paid were Medicaid or Medicare with the um, supplemental plans. Um, that have some restrictions. So we we've, um, feel that we've got um, pretty good reimbursement. We have one more question in the chat box now. In the chat box. I know we got you going back and forth. Uh, yeah. How do you report when one site only uses point and the other uses 2D, but the same radiologist reading? So, um, Ideally, they should have very similar numbers. Um, oftentimes, they are a little bit different. Um, and we like the 2D better because we can see where the artifacts are. In the point shear wave, you probably are including measurements that are including artifacts. Um, I Again, the variability between systems is about 10%. So if they're within 10% of each other, we do not consider that a change. Uh, it has to be greater than 10%. Um, and again, uh, when we are um, evaluating patients, we should try to do the same system the same way, the same depth, all these uh, factors uh, to get more reliable changes uh, in the patient. Um, but again, I, we like to use that 10% um, as a, the difference between a system, various systems. So um, for sure, I think the 2D gives you a little bit more reproducible results <clears throat> because we're eliminating the artifacts. And that seems to be it. Um, 
nothing else is coming in. So on that, we'll, um, we'll thank everybody for joining us on behalf of the AIUM and Samsung. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to remind you, as Dr. Barr commented, that a recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And we hope you'll join us again in the future for more webinars. Thank you, everyone.